In fifth place, we have the Unexplained Phoenix Lights. On March 13th of 1997, which just so happens to be the year I was born, a string of five lights in a V formation appeared in the sky above Phoenix, Arizona. The National UFO Reporting Center reported that the first call about the lights came in at around 8.16 p.m. from a retired police officer in Paulden, which is about two hours north of Phoenix. After that, the National UFO Reporting Center began to receive a slew of calls from south of Paulden, suggesting that the lights were moving in a southeastern direction. There are more than 700 witnesses who saw the lights, including pilots, police officers, and military officials, who lit up the National UFO Reporting Center switchboard, demanding explanations, and rightfully so. Most of the witnesses described the lights as part of a singular massive craft that made no noise. Around 10 p.m., a second set of as many as, you know, nine lights appeared in the sky. A laser printer technician named Dana Valentine claimed to have witnessed the craft from his yard in Phoenix, saying that he could see the outline of the mass behind the lights and was certain what he saw was technology unknown to mankind. Air traffic controllers could not see the lights on the radar, despite seeing them in the sky with their own eyes. Frances Barwood, the Phoenix City Councilwoman who launched an investigation into the event, said that out of the over 700 witnesses, yep, 700 that she interviewed, the government never interviewed even one. This is once again where I'm giving the US government some well-deserved side eye. How do you not interview a single witness out of 700? That is way too many people for this to not be credible. And once again, like I've said many, many times before here, so many witnesses happen to be credible air personnel. I'm sensing a pattern of behavior here and not a good one. In fourth place, we have a case of reincarnation. In the 1940s, Florence and John Pollock were married, and in 1946, after having two sons, they welcomed their first daughter, who was named Joanna. In 1951, Florence gave birth to another baby girl named Jacqueline. Despite their age differences, the two girls had an extremely close bond. Joanna liked to take care of Jacqueline and saw herself as the ultimate big sister. Since her mother was busy running the family's grocery delivery business, Joanna saw herself as a second mother to her little sister. They enjoyed playing dress up and pretending and generally enjoyed being around each other. Thank goodness because parentification is often more traumatizing than beneficial. Eerily, Joanna would always state that she would never grow up to become a lady, that she would remain young forever. No one took her seriously and chalked it up to a very creative imagination. Kind of like how I've always had. On May 7th of 1957, mid-single digits year old Jacqueline and double digits year old Joanna were walking to church with a neighborhood boy as they often did. While they were walking, a car came up behind them and it hit them going at an incredibly high speed, killing all three. The Pollock sisters died instantly, and the boy they were with died from his injuries at the hospital. The woman who was driving the car had just lost her wards in a custody battle and was feeling angry and upset and was actually trying to take her own life. While learning about her ward's deaths, Florence fell into a deep depression that lasted a very long time. John, on the other hand, had the spiritual belief that the girls were in heaven or that they'd be reincarnated. He said he would have dreams about the girls and also felt some sort of presence in their bedroom. He claimed that every time he would go in there, he felt like he wasn't alone, like they were watching over him. Now, John apparently always had a fascination with reincarnation and would pray to God to bring his daughters back. Okay. Florence, on the other hand, was a very strict Catholic and never toyed with any of John's notions about reincarnation. This put such a strain on the relationship that they almost got a divorce. However, somehow, they stayed together and got pregnant again. Congrats. I guess. From the beginning of the pregnancy, John thought that there were two babies, despite the doctor only claiming one. However, John kept insisting that there were two, and the doctor was proven wrong on the day that the twins, Jillian and Jennifer, were born on October 4th of 1958. Twins never ran of the family, and Florence never felt like she had two fetuses growing inside of her. Eerily, the newborn twins had the exact same birthmarks that Joanna and Jacqueline had, and Florence started to seriously consider her husband's beliefs as more than just nonsense. When the twins were old enough to talk, they began identifying and requesting toys that had belonged to their sisters, who had passed on, and would point out landmarks that only Joanna and Jacqueline would have known, like the school they attended. They would sometimes panic upon seeing cars and knew about street safety without either of their parents telling them about it. The story of the Pollock sisters made its way to Dr. Ian Stevenson, a psychologist who studied reincarnation. After studying thousands of reincarnation cases, Dr. Stevenson wrote a book telling of 14 cases he believed to have been real, including that of the Pollock sisters. Reincarnation is such a wild thing to think about. Personally, I don't know if I'd want to start all over with all the current knowledge and trauma that I have and then add more. I think I'd rather just be wiped clear and restart. Nah. Let me know in the comments if, what you think, though, and uh, if you'd want to be reincarnated or just 
hit restart. Number three, UFO sighting. In December 29, 1980, Betty Cash saw something on the outskirts of Houston near Dayton that would change the course of her life forever as she made a close encounter of the third kind. She was driving her friend Vicki Landrum and Landrum's grandson home one night at 9 p.m. when the three of them noticed a bright light in the sky. Betty Cash described it like this. We didn't know what it was, but we knew there was something that was lighting up the sky. We all began to feel heat, and all of a sudden, Vicky screamed for me to stop. When I stopped, I went forward, and her handprint was embedded in the dash of the car. And I thought, well, I've got to see what this is. So I got out, I walked towards the front of the car, and I stood there looking up, trying to figure out what this object was. Then a diamond shaped object appeared with flames shooting out. The heat was tremendous. When I reached for the door handle, the door was so hot I couldn't even begin to open it. The only thing I was thinking was, are we gonna get out of here alive? And then seemingly as soon as it appeared, it disappeared, and Landrum stated that moments later, a large squadron of black helicopters soared over the area. Huh. After the choppers cleared, Betty took the Landrums home and retired for the night. The next morning, however, Cash said she was extremely sick, suffering from nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, weakness, and an intense burning in her eyes. Now here's where things get curious. Landrum and her grandson all reported the exact same symptoms. Over the next few days, Cash said her symptoms worsened so much with large blisters forming on her skin, she eventually had to be taken to a hospital where she was treated for radiation poisoning and she lost large patches of skin and clumps of hair. To date, there has never been a conclusive answer to what happened to Cash and Landrum. The US government denied any involvement and said they don't have any diamond shaped crafts like that in their fleet and it wasn't from their government. Was the military testing new technology on unsuspecting victims? Was it a craft from another world touching down for a moment? There are so few answers and so, so many questions for this unsolved mystery. Number two, the death fields. There there is a stretch of I-45 highway between Houston and Galveston that is notorious to locals due to the string of violent, horrific crimes that have all occurred there since the 1970s. Since the first body was discovered, it's been thought that anywhere from 33 bodies have been discovered there, and the truly horrifying thing is how little police and authorities seem to have on this case. Initially, detectives believed that this work was that of a serial killer due to the sheer number of bodies being found in the area, but over time, some have wondered if it could be multiple criminals. Most of the victims have been young women, typically around college ages. The FBI has said that the agency's behavioral experts have created a profile of a possible killer, but there are no known witnesses to any of the crimes and no common person to connect them all. An official statement that was given by the FBI said that the signs point to one killer, although multiple killers can't be ruled out. Given the nature of the area where the bodies were found, it was likely someone with roots in the area. Someone who would have known these fields were a good place to hide a body. In 1998, a man named Edward Howard Bell was arrested and claimed to have been involved in the deaths of 11 girls in Galveston County. And although he was a suspect, in the aforementioned I-45 case, police unfortunately didn't have enough evidence to tie him to those larger crimes. Only one death on the I-45 was ever convicted when Louisiana police arrested Kevin Edison Smith in 2009 on a completely unrelated charge. A DNA test found that it matched the body of a girl who had disappeared from Texas in 1996 and whose body was tragically found on the I-45. From this confession and conviction from two different criminals, it's suspected that multiple people were were involved in these grisly crimes. Hopefully one day this case can be closed for good and the I-45 can go back to just being a highway. And number one, the Servant Girl Annihilator. Perhaps one of the most infamous criminals to ever live in Austin and to this day is still anonymous and possibly will forever. The Servant Girl Annihilator, absolutely brutally named, I cannot believe they called him that, was a serial killer who preyed on young women in Austin between 1884 and 85. He is thought by some to be America's first serial killer, a hardly a badge of honor if you ask me. He attacked wantonly and despite his name he was not exclusively targeting women. He fatally attacked seven women, one man, and additionally seriously 
injured six women and two men. All of his victims he would attack indoors while asleep and then would finish the job outside leaving them to be found. His victims were all posed in similar manners and were all found with a sharp object inserted into their ears. Texan lawman started a manhunt for the criminal, arresting 400 men in the year of 85 in a desperate attempt for any leads on who was terrorizing the community. Interestingly, the top theory of elected officials at the time was that the servant girl annihilator couldn't possibly have been committing all of these crimes by himself as one lone deranged criminal, but rather an identity shared by a group of men carrying out heinous acts all together. Now, in the end, no one was ever successfully accused of being the servant girl annihilator. And what happened to him was additional police patrols and civilian militias around Austin ended up scaring the annihilator off. Or so you think. A theory, although an outlandish one, is that the servant girl annihilator would move to London to continue his crimes as three years later the Whitechapel killings would start and Jack the Ripper would terrorize the streets of London, leading to some people suspecting that maybe these two lunatics were connected in a way. Think about that, a globe trotting serial killer wasn't content with just one, had to move, get two different scary nicknames. Imagine if your both your nicknames were servant girl annihilator and Jack the Ripper, a little much for one guy if you ask me. Number 5. The Ghost Bride of Galvez To Texans, it's no secret that Hotel Galvez is haunted. The Grand Galvez, as it's known now, first opened its doors in 1911 and since then has been said to be home to all manner of haunting, but the most retold story is that of Audra, the Ghost Bride of Galvez. Audra was a 25 year old bride to be, getting married there. Her betrothed was a young sailor who would frequently leave her on her lonesome while he was out on a voyage. During the periods where the sea would separate the two lovers, Audra would rent out room 5 501, climb out the ladder to the rooftop and wait on the rooftop turret with love in her heart for her sweetheart to return. Now one day during a catastrophic storm, Audra was told that her fiance's ship capsized and overcome with grief, Audra took her own life on the roof of the hotel. Tragically, as if this wasn't sad enough, her groom would arrive a few days later eager to surprise and re-encounter his bride as he'd survived the capsizing. And although he was never able to be with her physically again, if you believe the stories, she might still linger around the premises. Visitors claim that Audra frequents the fifth floor and in particular her spirit tends to hang around the matrimonial suite and room 501. Some claim they hear random doors slamming or strong currents of chills, flickering lights, the usual who's who of a ghost haunting a hotel. Other stories tell of seeing a candle lit on the rooftop, wondering if it's the ghost of Audra still waiting for her beloved to come back to her. The attendants at the Galvez claim that there's difficulties making electronic keys for room 501 since they're prone to malfunction frequently. Visitors to the Galvez go out specifically looking for Audra now, hoping to catch a glimpse of the spirit. If you ever go to Texas, be sure to check it out if you're brave enough. And if you're looking for more freaky stories, true crime, ghosts, cryptids, basically the whole nine yards, Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. So click on that bell and click on through and subscribe and find something to scream at. But do that at the end of this video, okay? We got way more mysteries in Texas coming up. Number 4. The Icebox Killer The Icebox Killer refers to an incredibly grisly crime that haunted Houston and if you believe the conspiracies, might be entangled in a much larger web of interest. Take a listen to this brutal crime. On June 23rd, 1965, two Houston police officers were sent for a fairly benign wellness check and went to investigate the home of a suburban family, the Rogers, Fred and Edwina, and their son Charles. Edwina's nephew was concerned because he hadn't seen or heard from his aunt in a concerning amount of time. The two officers went to check the house and got no response from a knock. A look around in the backyard, they found a makeshift barricade on the back door, which was more than a little suspicious, so they entered the house. One of the two detectives opened the the fridge instinctively and saw a pile of raw meat in the fridge. The detective dismissed it as boar or pig and, and you can probably see where this is going. They opened the vegetable crisper and were disgusted at what they found. The heads of Edwina and Fred Rogers. Police suspected initially that the son Charles had been behind it, but why? No one was particularly sure. Now here's where this already upsetting strange case gets wild. There are allegations that Charles Rogers was present the day of the JFK assassination and some allege he was one of the three tramps photographed with police escort by Dealey Plaza. The conspiracy alleges that Charles Rogers, who was a former marine and served in the office of naval intelligence, was involved somehow in the larger assassination plot and the claim is that somehow his parents discovered his involvement with the conspiracy 
and he had to silence them and flee. A bold claim, but Charles Rogers was never found. No proof of a body, despite being declared dead. Now, did he vanish? Or was he himself silenced to tie up a loose knot as part of something infinitely larger than himself? We may never truly have the answers for this one. In third place, we have the incident at Diet Love Pass. On the first night of February 1959, nine ski hikers had set up camp on a slope in the Russian mountains, enjoyed dinner, and prepared for sleep. But something went catastrophically wrong because the group never returned to civilization. On February 26th, searchers found the hikers' abandoned tent, which had been ripped open from the inside. Surrounding the area were footprints left by the group, some wearing socks, some wearing a single shoe, some barefoot, all of which continued to the edge of a nearby wood, which is where the uh, first two bodies were found shoeless and wearing only underwear. The scene bore marks of death by hypothermia, but as medical examiners inventoried the bodies, as well as the other seven that were discovered over the months that followed, hypothermia was no longer making sense. As a matter of fact, the evidence made no sense at all. One body had evidence of a blunt force trauma, another had third degree burns, one had been vomiting a red liquid that should still be in their veins, yet another one was missing a tongue, and some of their clothing was found to be radioactive. Alrighty, this is where I would just call it a day and condemn the entire freaking area. That's one too many weird variations to make sense in my brain. Also, anything radioactive? Burn it. Burn it all. Theories about what happened include KGB interference, drug overdose, UFO presence, gravity anomalies, and a yeti? The most recent theory involves a terrifying but real phenomenon called infrasound, in which the wind interacts with the topography to create a barely audible hum that can induce powerful feelings of nausea, panic, dread, chills, nervousness, raised heartbeat rate, and breathing difficulties. Add that to my list of why I never want to go hiking. Mm, granted, I didn't really want to go hiking in the first place. In second place, we have the Watcher House. In June of 2014, Maria and Derek Broadus and their three spawn were getting ready to move into their new home, 657 Boulevard in Westfield, New Jersey. They claimed the six bedroom house was their dream home, and it just so happened to be located a couple of blocks away from Maria's childhood home in one of the top 30th safest cities in the United States. Sounds a little too good to be true if I'm adding my two cents to this. Three days after closing the sale, before the Broadus family had even begun to move in, a letter arrived in their new mailbox. The letter was addressed to the new owner, in big clunky handwriting, and read as follows. Dearest new neighbor at 657 Boulevard, allow me to welcome you to the neighborhood. How did you end up here? Did 657 Boulevard call to you with its force within? 657 Boulevard has been the subject of my family for decades now, and as it approaches its 110th birthday, I have been put in charge of watching and waiting for its second coming. My grandfather watched the house in the 1920s, and my father watched in the 19. 1960s. It is now my time. Who am I? There are hundreds and hundreds of cars that drive by 657 Boulevard each day. Maybe I am in one. Look at all the windows you can see from 657 Boulevard. Maybe I am in one. Look out any of the many windows in 657 Boulevard and at all the people who stroll by each day. Maybe I am one. Yeah, okay. The letter also mentioned specifics about the Broadus family, talking about the offspring and that the unknown author had seen them, stating that, so far, I think there are three that I have counted. Do you need to fill the house with the young I requested? Better for me. Was your old house too small for the growing family? Or was agreed to bring me yours? Once I know their names, I will call them and draw them to me. Yeah, okay. Pardon the narrator voice. I just like to differentiate. At the bottom of the letter, the author used a cursive font to sign The Watcher. Okay, this is where I wish I had a red flag to start waving around, so uh, just imagine it in my hand. Okie dokie. After receiving the letter, the Broadus family reached out to the previous family who had sold in the house, John and Andrea Woods. They stated that during the 23 years of living at 657 Boulevard, they had never received a letter like that except once, a few days before they were getting ready to move out of the house. The Woods family also stated that they had never felt watched in the two decades they had lived at the house, and in fact, rarely felt the need to lock their door at night. While they thought the note they received was odd, they threw it away without much concern. Red flag notice again. That's something people should know about. Thankfully, the two families went to the police with the letters and an investigation was opened. The police warned the families not to tell anyone about the letters, including their neighbors who were all suspects. Two weeks later, even though the Broadus family still hadn't moved in, they received a second letter with even more chilling specifics about the family, including the offspring's birth order and nicknames. The watcher also asked if the wards would sleep in the attic or would the entire family sleep on the second floor. Who has bedrooms facing the street? I will know as soon as you move in. It will help me to know who is in which bedroom. Then I can plan better. This is where I would have done everything in my power to avoid ever going near that place and moving across the country. Nope, 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 nope. Pardon me, stalking and harassment are issues that really get under my skin. Several weeks later, when the Broadus family had put their plans on hold to move in, a third letter arrived saying, Where have you gone to? 657 Boulevard is missing you. 
Okay, by the end of 2014, the case had stalled completely. There was no digital trail, and the mental effects were taking a toll on the Broaddus family. No kidding! That kind of watching over your shoulder can take a mental toll like you wouldn't believe unless you've gone through it yourself. There were no fingerprints and no way to place somebody at the scene of the crime. Only six months after they received the letters, they decided to sell the home. Good on them for doing so. This place has since been sold and is currently off the market while the watcher's identity still remains a mystery. In first place, we have a case of human combustion. What can I say? I thought I'd end today on a fiery note. On July 2nd of 1951, in St. Petersburg, Florida, Mary Reeser was visited by her son, Dr. Richard Reeser, in her apartment and mentioned during their conversation that she had taken two mild sedatives and planned to take two more before bed. Hey, whatever helps you sleep. Later that night, she would fall asleep in an upholstered chair for the last time as she would become the victim of an apparent house fire. The next morning, Mary's landlord reported smelling smoke around 5 a.m. But it wasn't until 8 a.m. when she went to go deliver a telegraph to Mary that she would smell the smoke again. She discovered soot in the hallway, and the doorknob leading to Mary's apartment was too hot to grab, so she enlisted the help of nearby house painters to get into the apartment. What they found inside said apartment was truly horrifying. Mary's skull was reportedly shrunk to the size of a cup, and parts of her spine also remained. Her left foot was found still in its black satin slipper, with the skin unburned, but the rest of her remains had been, uh, completely cremated. What makes this case even more odd, because that wasn't odd enough, was the environment of her surroundings. Fun science fact for everyone, in order for a body to be cremated, the body must burn at 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit for three to four hours. But somehow the surrounding area of Mary's chair and the rest of her apartment were relatively unaffected. The walls had no burn marks and showed no signs of scorching or burned paint. Light switches were melted, but outlets were still completely functional. Candlesticks had melted, but their wicks stood upright. And a stack of newspapers close to the chair was uh, undamaged. You know, the easily flammable thing. Mary's neighbors were also unaware of the fire. Look, I can write off a list of things that wouldn't phase me from a neighbor at this point in my life, but the smell of smoke is definitely something I would be freaking out about. The FBI eventually came up with some form of cover-up, but I'm not gonna waste anyone's time with that since it doesn't make any sense. Coming in at number 5, we have the narwhal tusk. If any of you have ever seen the movie Elf, then you're familiar with the cute narwhal in the beginning of the movie. And that movie really brought narwhals to the public's attention, and making this sea creature more popular than ever before. But so much about this creature is a mystery. In 1577, the English explorer Martin Frobisher led an expedition of 150 men to the northern Canada in search of gold, but they had come across something they had never intended, and that was the sea unicorn. The myth of the unicorn goes back centuries and the business of unicorn horn trade was sustained through the Middle Ages and Renaissance by Vikings who killed the so-called sea unicorns, cut off their horns and sold them for an astronomical price. As European naturalists became more familiar with the world's animal, the myth of the unicorn faded. The mystery of the sea unicorn continued. Frobisher's discovery was actually what we know today as the narwhal, but the horn itself continues to be speculated by many. But the horn is apparently not a horn at all, but is a tooth. The relatives of narwhal include species like the beluga whales, orcas and dolphins, but the mystery remains of how did this massive freakish tooth evolve in this one specific species after its ancestors branched off from whales with ordinary teeth. Many scientists and researchers debate about what this tooth is used for and some suggest it's an acoustic probe, a rudder, an ice picker or a spear for battling predators. These creatures don't make it easy for researchers to see them use their tusk for anything at all, so it makes many people continue to question it. Many have come up with many different theories about this so-called horn and what they use it for and why they have it. It has created a huge debate between researchers and scientists to this day, but no definite answer has come out to this day. In at number 4 we have the submarine disappearances in 1968. This is one giant mysterious situation which is the disappearance of four submarines from four different countries in 1968. The USS Scorpion, a Soviet submarine K129, a French submarine Minerve and the INS Dakar went inexplicably missing over just a five month period period, and the last two disappearing only four days apart. The exact causes of these sinkings remain unknown and remain a mystery over 50 years later. The INS Dhaka was scheduled to arrive in Israel on January 29th, 1968. When it didn't return, searchers went out to find it, but after a while there was no sign of the missing submarine. So the search ended on February 4th, and the 69-man crew was officially declared dead in 1981. The cause of the sinking was never determined, and theories say that either a mechanical or human error caused a catastrophe 
catastrophic accident, or that the submarine snorkel was damaged after hitting another ship, causing it to flood. The Minerve was on the training operation in the Mediterranean on January 27, 1968, and when they were on their way home, the men were caught in a bad storm. When it was 30 miles away from the port, the Minerve made contact with the men on land and said it would port in about an hour, but an hour came and went, and the submarine had never returned. A frantic search was conducted with 20 vessels and aircrafts trying to locate the Minerve, but it was eventually called off on February 2nd when they found nothing. The K129 with a crew of 98 descended on March 8, 1968, and almost two weeks into patrol on the North Pacific, the K129 failed to send a scheduled radio message. The Soviets soon began a frantic search, and after two months of no sign of the submarine, they gave up their search. The cause of the ship sinking remains unknown and will likely never be known. Almost three months after the K129, the USS Scorpion, a nuclear powered attack submarine with a crew of 99 men, went missing in the Atlantic while on its way back from a patrol in the Mediterranean. It was sent out on February 15th, 1968, and toward the end of its patrol, it radioed that it was expected to return on May 27th. But as you can guess, the USS Scorpion would never return. Like the others, many searched for the lost ship, but on June 5th, the Scorpion and its crew were declared presumed lost. Over the years, there have been multiple searches for these submarines, but only parts have been recovered, and it's considered one of the biggest mysteries that happened in the sea. No one knows why so many went missing in such a short amount of time, how exactly they went missing for so long, and what exactly made these vessels disappear. And this is a mystery we may never get the answer to. In at three, Villa de Vecchi. Just east of Lake Como in the forested mountains of Cortanova lies a house that is said to be haunted, nicknamed the Red House, Ghost Mansion, and Casa del Estre. Built between 1854 to 1857 as the summer residence of Count Felix de Vecchi. However, as most creepy stories go, a few short years after its completion, the house witnessed an inexplicable string of tragedies that would forever haunt its walls. First, architect Alessandro Sadoli died a year before the villa was completed, and many would later speculate his death was the first omen. The family moved in nonetheless, and during the spring and summer months, they led an idyllic and, well, brief existence. Sometime in 1862, things took a turn when the Count returned home to find his wife brutally murdered and daughter missing. He then put on a lengthy and sadly unsuccessful search for his daughter before committing suicide that same year. The villa was then passed on to Felix's brother Diego, who continued to live on the estate with his family until World War II, after which time they vacated for good. The house bounced around various owners and renters for a while until being left permanently uninhabited by the 1960s. Naturally, elements have taken over the home, but the large majority of damage has been done by humans. Griffey the city covers the walls and almost everything in the house has been vandalized. However, its rumors of hauntings, ritualistic orgies, and sacrifices is what leaves the home unoccupied. Spooky is still in 2002, an avalanche wiped out all of the surrounding homes in the area, all except the Villa de Vici. Now, although trespassers always return, they always leave with hauntings to report. In at two, Los Feliz Murder Mansion. During the mid 20th century, the Los Feliz Mansion was a seemingly happy home, for a short time that is. It housed Dr. Harold Perelson and his family until the horrific night of December 6th, 1959. It was on that night that Harold struck his wife to death with a hammer, severely beating his daughter, then ended his own life using a concoction of water, acid, and tranquilizer pills. Now, for the next 50 years, the murder mansion would remain completely untouched and uninhabited by anyone. One year after the horrific events, the home was sold to a couple, Emily and Julian Enriquez, who only used the mansion as a storage unit. Imagine being that rich. Lucky for some. Neighbors recall seeing the couple bringing boxes to the house, but never staying the night. Jump forward to 1994, and Rudy Enriquez inherited the house and, like his parents, refused to stay overnight. Local residents have shared their stories of the tragic mansion, some claiming through grimy windows you can see a 1950s style television vision set, a Christmas tree, and supposedly neatly wrapped gifts. The furniture is rumored to be covered in a thick layer of dust, and the living room remains the exact same as it was that one December night back in 1959. Now, although no one has been formally invited into the home, that hasn't stopped trespassers from having picnics in the garden, with many alleging that the house is haunted, with one trespasser stating that she was bitten by a black widow spider upon trying to break in. No one knows what prompted Dr. Perelson to murder his wife and commit suicide. 
with some speculating financial woes, while others have dug up old unconfirmed rumours of Dr. Perelson having been secretly hospitalised. Jump forward to 2019, what remains is an even larger mystery in a haunted home that no one can enter. And finally, coming in at number one, Gene Harlow's house. Los Angeles seems to be the hub for paranormal activity, or perhaps it's because it's the hub for movies and everyone is a storyteller. We'll never know. Anyway, in LA you can find this Bavarian style home in Beverly Hills, which has a truly gruesome history. In 1932 it was home to Jean Harlow and her abusive husband Paul Byrne for about two months before he shot himself in the head while standing in front of the mirror. Their butler discovered him and called MGM instead of the police. So of course there were a ton of rumours that it wasn't suicide and in turn a cover up. Prime suspect was Burns ex girlfriend, a suspicion that was exasperated by her jumping off a boat a couple days after. Following the death, Jean moved out of the home but died at the age of 26 only a few years later. However, it gets creepier. In 1963, celebrity hairstylist Jay Sebring bought the home and lived there with Sharon Tate until she left him for Roman Polanski. They were still friends even up until they were both murdered by Charles Manson's cult. However, when Jay and Sharon lived in the Harlow house, Sharon reportedly told several friends of some strange goings on within the home. An example being once when she was sleeping in the master bedroom, she saw a creepy little man, with some of her friends stating that she believed it was the ghost of Paul Byrne. According to sources, she was so freaked out when she saw the ghost that she ran out of the room and then saw a hanging shadowy corpse with its throat slit in the hallway, which resembles quite closely how Sharon Tate was murdered. Spooky. Number 5. D.B. Cooper One of the most infamous disappearance cases in history and I'm going to be honest, probably my personal favourite unsolved mystery of all time. If you haven't heard the story of the real life daredevil heister, Mr. D.B. Cooper, you're in for a treat and then some. Depending on your definition of success, you could argue D.B. Cooper might be the most successful criminal in history, since not only did he get off with quite an impressive take, but he got away with all his crimes and avoided capture, if he's still alive that is. On November 24th, 1971, a man using an alias of Dan Cooper walked up to the ticket counter at Portland International and booked a one-way ticket to Seattle, claiming that he was on business. He was technically correct in that assessment. Once on board the plane, Cooper passed a note to a flight attendant and he was not asking for an extra bag of peanuts and fluffing his pillow. No, he was just letting the attendant know that he had brought a bomb on board the flight and demanded $200,000 and four parachutes. And if he caught a whiff of any funny business, he'd turn this plane into a national tragedy on the 6 o'clock news, see? So you know, nothing unreasonable really. I make all those demands whenever I'm hangry, pretty normal stuff. So the plane landed in Seattle, as originally plant and authorities were summoned to deliver the ransom money and parachutes to Cooper. The passengers were relieved and eventually let go, but the flight crew was stuck with their new boss, Mr. Cooper, who would taken them hostage. Cooper seized the plane, planning a flight path to Mexico City, but midway through the flight, Cooper, who was a huge fan of the film Point Break and wanted to pay homage to it, jumped out of a plane with all of the money. D.B. Cooper jumping out of that plane with a suitcase full of money would be the last time anyone ever saw him. He jumped out of that plane and into the stuff of history book legends, the hall of fame of heisters. Move over payday crew, this guy's got you beat. Despite extensive searching, not a hair of D.B. Cooper ever turned up. Some speculate, rather bluntly, that perhaps he miscalculated the angle and splattered somewhere across the northwest and the heist wasn't as impressive as we thought, while others imagined that he got off easy, he's knocking back Mai Tais on a Hawaiian island enjoying the spoils of his loot. But who was the guy to begin with? A career crook on one last job? Someone trying it out? Someone snapping? Several theories suggest he was ex-military, special forces, which would explain his proficiency. In fact, the leading hypothesis is that he was ex-military. We may never know who the real D.B. Cooper is, and that's fine. That's the way he'd want it. And if we don't know who he is, it makes it that much more fun for us. He could be any one of us. He could be you. He could be me. He could be... Oh, I'll stop talking there.
And if you're looking for more scary videos and strange stories out there, we've got all of that and then some. If you can think it up, we've probably done a video or two on it. We've got quite the catalog. So click on through, hit subscribe, and please tickle that little bell and make sure you don't miss a single scream. But would you kindly do that at the end of this video? Because I got four more missing persons cases ready for you now. Number four, the Mary Celeste. Our next mysterious case is a bit of an outlier, a little bit of a cheat. I know, I know. It's not just one person going going missing, it's an entire ship. How does that happen? December 1872, the captain of the Mary Celeste, one Benjamin Briggs, cast off to New York to travel to Italy for unknown reasons, but probably for the tomatoes. The ship was kept to a rather tight crew. A staff of eight, plus Briggs's wife and daughter, were enough to man the vessel. The voyage seemed like it went pretty well until another vessel, the Del Gradia, came into contact with the Celeste and were chilled at what they'd found when they recovered the ship drifting aimlessly. As rescuers boarded the ship, they were greeted with a maritime mystery to forever haunt them. The ship seemed to be in perfect working order. No signs of damage or distress. Had it not been found freely floating, they'd assume the ship was just built. Aside from a single lifeboat missing, the ship was in good condition. The holds stocked with food and water. The crew's personal belongings were scattered about. The table was set for a meal, as if the crew had been minutes away from breaking bread. So what happened? What reasonable captain would abandon a perfectly serviceable well-stocked ship? While reasonable explanations were offered, theories of piracy or mutiny prevailing. Now, the ship being relatively untouched does call into question the notion of piracy, as I don't know how much you know about pirates, but they didn't tend to leave the rum behind if there is any. Any pirate captain worth his salt would have plundered that thing down to the floorboards. And there didn't appear to be any struggle at all, so no forceful evacuation, nobody kicked them off the ship. So with rationale out of the way, we've nowhere left to turn but blind and wild speculation. Theories of supernatural beings, cursed gold, vengeful spirits, sea monsters, Davy Jones. Take your pick of whatever nautical bedtime story you think could have overtaken the Mary Celeste. And you know what? Let me know down below. I love pirate ghost stories more than anything. Perhaps it was a bit of sea madness? Cabin fever? Maybe it's whatever happened to those two guys in the lighthouse happened to them here? No matter how you slice it, the vanishing of the Mary Celeste is a head scratcher of a mystery. More lost souls to the darkness that lurks below the ocean's water. Wear yourselves against the whispers that echo the seas, for the spirits of the Mary Celeste may still be watching, eager to claim another. Coming in at number three, we have the Bermuda Triangle. Named for the triangular shape of around 500,000 square miles of ocean between Miami, Bermuda, and Puerto Rico, for centuries the Bermuda Triangle has been mystified as a harrowing patch of ocean where sailors and pilots are prone to lose contact with the natural world and disappear here forever. Back when Christopher Columbus first sailed the area, he claimed to see a giant ball of light in the sky that crashed into the horizon and made it glow. Soon after, all sorts of strange events happened in the area, including several boats mysteriously disappearing, and in one incident in 1945, an entire squadron of US torpedo bombers vanished into thin air due to all these weird instances, giving this place the name the Devil's Triangle. The exact number of ships and airplanes that have disappeared is not known, but it's estimated that around 50 ships ships and 20 planes have been victim to the Bermuda Triangle, and many of these mysterious disappearances of these ships and planes have never been recovered. Many see the Bermuda Triangle as a real phenomenon, and have multiple theories to try and explain this mysterious place. And some of these theories are human error, paranormal explanations, violent weather like hurricanes, the Gulf Stream, which is a major surface current within the ocean, methane hydrates, which is a form of natural gas that causes bubbles to form around the ship and ultimately sink it without warning. All of these are only theories and the Bermuda Triangle to this day is the most notorious sea legend of all time. In at number two, we have the Gulf of Mexico's cursed shipwreck. An estimated 4,000 shipwrecks litter the seabed across the stretch of water, and the Gulf of Mexico is one of the wealthiest locations for maritime archaeology in the world. In February 2001, oil workers for ExxonMobil were laying some pipeline when they happened to stumble upon a shipwreck about 2,600 feet deep. After discovering the wreckage, a team was assembled to explore this mysterious ship, but nothing seemed to go right. The exploration submarine malfunctioned right as it was getting ready to go down to check out the wreck, and that was only the beginning of these mysterious 
mysterious malfunctions. Others include video monitors going out whenever they fired their thrusters, sonars breaking and hydraulics going haywire with no explanation for any of these problems. After nothing working and things continuing to break, the Navy sent a researcher submarine down to investigate the wreckage, and on the way down it suddenly self destructed, and somehow when it finally did get to the wreck, its arms were too short to reach anything. Six months later in July in 2002, a team working aboard the NR1 decided to launch a robotic sub down to the wreck site, but the malfunctions continued. The second the rover entered the water, it veered to the right and went out of control. The tether had caught in the propellers, which caused the vessel to smash into the underside of the ship and the rover was never recovered. Later in the summer of 2002, the curse would continue as a ship from Sustainable Sea Program of the NOAA offered to pick up artifacts from the site. The first time the vessel attempted to leave the dock, debris was lodged in the propeller. The second time the propeller locked and the ship ended up in dry lock, needing repairs. Over the years, many others have tried to learn more about this wreck, but little was found, and what was found wasn't at all helpful. To this day, nothing has been able to get too close to the shipwreck to investigate and explore the phenomenon and very little is known about this mysterious ship. Many believe the lives lost in the wreck continue to haunt the ship and will keep anyone and everything out of it at all costs. And finally, in at number one, we have the unmapped ocean floor. This is truly one of the biggest mysteries, and humans' curiosity about the Earth's floor is centuries old. Much remains to be learned about the ocean, especially exploring the mystery of the deep sea. From mapping and describing the physical, biological, geological, chemical, and archaeological aspects of the ocean and understanding their dynamics. For centuries, scholars believed the deep sea to be a lifeless place until the late 19th century. We've discovered there is a diversity of life and creatures living down there. Many researchers and divers had tried to dive and take submarines down to explore more of this unknown place, but it's very hard due to the extremely cold temperatures, the darkness, and the literally bone-shattering pressure that's more than 1,000 times that at sea level. In 2019, a retired naval officer, Victor Vescovo, set a new record as one of the deepest dives to date, reaching almost 36,000 feet down in a submarine into the deepest place on Earth, the Marianas Trench. The ocean covers more than 70% of the planet's surface, driving well weather, regulating temperature, and ultimately supporting all life's organisms. Throughout history, the ocean has been a vital source of sustenance, transport, commerce, growth, and inspiration. But to this day, more than 80% of the ocean remains unmapped, unobserved, and unexplored, and it's still unknown how deep the ocean really is. Given the high degree of difficulty and cost in exploring our ocean using underwater vehicles, researchers have relied heavily on technologies such as sonar to generate maps of the seafloor, but currently less than 10% of the global ocean is mapped using modern sonar technology, and only about 35% of the United States have been mapped using modern methods. As we go deeper into the ocean floor, it's too deep for this modern technology because it's too remote and dark for this type of visual mapping. So if you go swimming in the ocean, it's very unknown of what is swimming and living below you. But scientists and researchers continue to develop technologies to unlock the many secrets of the ocean. The NOAA is working to increase our understanding of the ocean realm. In at 5, dear Dave. David. On August 7th, 2017, Adam Ellis took to Twitter to tell his terrifying encounter with a ghost named David. It began on a Monday, I quote, So my apartment is currently being haunted by the ghost of a dead child and he's trying to kill me. He started appearing in dreams but I think he's crossed over into the real world now. The first time I saw him, I was experiencing sleep paralysis and saw a child sitting in the green rocking chair at the foot of my bed. He had a huge misshapen head that was dented on one side. For a while he just stared at me, but then he got out of the chair and started shambling towards the bed. I couldn't move because I was paralysed. Right before he reached my bed, I woke up screaming. I had another dream a few nights later where I was in a library and a girl came up to me and said, You've seen Dear David, haven't you? I was like, Who? And she said, Dear David, you saw him. She continued, He's dead, he only appears at midnight and you can ask him two questions if you said Dear David first. Then she added, but never try to ask him a third question, or he'll kill you. I was very shaken. Having two dreams about the same thing is pretty weird. Anyway, a couple weeks passed without incident. Then David came back in another dream. Same situation. I was in bed and he was sitting in the rocking chair near the window, staring at me. In the dream I say, Dear David, how did you die? He mumbles, an accident in a store. I say, Dear David, what happened in the store? He groans. A shelf was pushed on my head. I'm frozen with fear. I ask, who pushed the shelf? 
David doesn't answer. I realise that I've asked a third question, which I'm not supposed to do. At that point I wake up absolutely terrified. The next couple of days I google deaths in the city but can't find anything about a kid named David dying in a store. Even try different names, Daniel, Dylan, Devon, nothing. A few weeks go by without incident, sort of randomly the apartment above mine is vacated and I have the opportunity to move into it. It's a larger apartment so I'm thrilled. Another month or two goes by and I sort of forget about dear David, I think he lost track of me because I moved upstairs. But lately something strange is happening. For the last 4 nights my cats gather at the front door at exactly midnight and just stare at it, almost like something is on the other side. And that's where I am right now. Dear David found me, I think, I don't know what to do, I'll keep you updated. And that he did. Dear David continued for over a year. The story is long but so so terrifying and I wish I could read the entire thing out but that would take hours and everyone would hate me but we'll link it below. In at 4, full heart, wet hands. Now this story was submitted to the website My Uni Days by author Alex who says, I quote, So I used to live at this address, they blacked it out. The houses were built to house the people building the railway in Derby in the 1800s. I only found this out after I left the house thankfully. It was a creepy house, really foreboding and every time I washed my hair in the shower, every time I opened my eyes, I expected something to be there. Anyway, I came back from an afternoon lecture. I opened the door, walked up the first flight of stairs and saw a wet handprint on the floor. A really wet handprint. I was a bit like, hmm, very strange. At the moment, at that moment, but I didn't freak out. It was just out of the ordinary. So I walked up to see my housemate, Ed. I opened the door and he was on the phone to his girlfriend. Not crying, but massively in distress. That was when the penny dropped. He then told me that as he was walking up the stairs earlier carrying a glass of water, he felt something cold go through him, almost a push, causing him to drop the water. He picked up the glass and ran up the stairs to his room. The water falling out the glass had created a handprint on the floor, literally a handprint. Every digit was in proportion. I did freak out at this moment as I'd put the two and two together. I told everyone to get out of the house, which we did, but then sheepishly returned after a fever session around and at the friend's house. It was genuinely terrifying, might not sound it but it was, and all true. If someone offered me $50 to go back and spend the night there by myself, despite the fact that I lived there for a year without almost no incident, I wouldn't. There was something there that didn't want 6 college guys there. This is truly terrifying and I likely would have done the same thing. Run. Something was clearly lingering in the home that wasn't at ease. Now the handprint has the potential of making but the sensation of a person pushing you, now that is something else entirely. No thank you. Also, you'd have to pay me more than 50 bucks to go back. Number 3. Frederick Valentich. Our next mysterious case is Frederick Valentich, an Australian pilot, a well trained aerial ace. He had 150 hours of man flight experience and was permitted to fly alone, provided it was in good weather conditions. He also had a love of extraterrestrial life, a deep desire to find that unknown above. Well, Valentich might have got his wish. Tragically, it might have cost him his life. The year was 1978. Frederick Valentich was performing a 125 nautical mile training flight flying to a small landmass called Kings Island. While at 4500 feet in the air, Valentich thought he had seen something with him. The Melbourne Flight Service insisted that there wasn't anything in the air with him, but Frederick radioed back and said that there was something on his tail. He claimed that he saw something glowing with four repeating bright lights and was rushing past him and he described it as shiny, metallic and chrome and looking like a small manned craft. Now, unsure what was happening, Valentich on radio to ground control told them that he was experiencing engine troubles inexplicably. Could this strange flying object be the source of these unexpected problems? Valentich complained out about whatever was following him to the Melbourne Flight Service, saying, It's hovering and it's not an aircraft. Those would be the last words anyone ever heard from Frederick. Minutes after that last transmission, he went silent and the plane or the mysterious craft was never found. An intense search revealed nothing. No sign of the man. The only lead was a local farmer alleging that the day Frederick disappeared, he saw what looked like a civilian aircraft 
seemingly fused with what looked like a saucer. The farmer told authorities he was worried about being dismissed as a crackpot, so he didn't tell anyone what he saw that day. What do you think? Should he have checked his eyes better? Or was he perhaps the last person to see the remnant of Frederick Valentich before he was carried off into who knows what? Number 2. Michael Rockefeller When Michael Rockefeller was born, he was born with a silver spoon to a lineage of millionaires in the late 1930s. His great grandfather, one John Rockefeller, is one of the richest men to have ever lived. The Rockefellers had hoped that Michael would follow them in the family business. Michael, however, had other ideas and wanted to use his millions of dollars to goof off and take it easy, which is what most of us would, I think. Michael had wanderlust in his heart and a deep interest in anthropology, specifically focused on Nigerian, Mayan, and Aztec cultures. Michael's father sat on a board of a museum in New York where Michael would discover this passion, hoping to one day open a collection of indigenous art in New York. After some discussions with the Dutch Museum of Ethnology, terrible name, Michael had decided he would set out to the massive island off the coast of Australia, at the time known as Dutch New Guinea. In 1961, he set off to collect the art of the Azmat people who lived there. It would be a one-way trip. The Azmat people that he was going to study were very disconnected from the rest of the world. They had previously seen Dutch colonizers, but otherwise they weren't getting a ton of visitors. The Azmat believed that the land beyond their island was inhabited by spirits, and they saw the Euros and the Americans as supernatural beings that had come over from across the sea. Michael and his team were allowed to study the people, but were banned from purchasing or taking anything, which held a great deal of significance to the Azmat. Nonetheless, Michael was thrilled with everything he'd been finding and could not wait to open his exhibit. In November 1961, Michael was on a boat accompanied by other anthropologists when a sudden squall threw the boat off its course. 12 miles away from the shore, but Michael insisted he could swim for it, and he was never seen again. The Rockefellers would spend the next few months spending a small fortune trying to find Michael, but gave up after never uncovering anything. The case went cold for years, but officers believed that Michael hadn't been lost to the water, but was rather offered as part of a sacrifice. His head chopped off, his flesh eaten, his bones made into weaponry, you know. Fun stuff. An investigator, one Carl Hoffman, uncovered this while filming the Azmat people. He saw a group of men acting out a scene, miming the act of, um, removing someone's head from the rest of their neck and attacking them with spears. Now, we can't really find this footage, but through interpretation and translation was a stern warning to the other villagers that Hoffman reported. Pop your ears open and take a listen. Don't you tell this story to any other man. I hope you remember it and you must keep this for us. I hope this is for you and you only. Don't talk to anyone, to other people, or another village. If people question you, don't answer. Don't talk to them because the story is only for you. If you tell it to them, you'll die. Or any other village because the story is only for us. I, I, probably, I probably shouldn't have shared it just then, now. Maybe just scrub that. Number one, Lars Mittank. Lars Mittank is a young German man who became infamous in 2014 when his disappearance captured the attention of the world. Last seen on airport security footage, he's been called the most famous missing person on YouTube. Wow, isn't that a lovely title? I'd put that right on my resume. In July 2014, Mitank was vacationing in Varna, Bulgaria, I've heard lovely things, with a group of friends. Apparently things were pretty unremarkable until an argument about football at a bar turned into a brawl. You see, Mitank was a Bremen man and he was getting into an argument of some nasty Bayern fans. I actually don't know nothing about German football. Clear that up in the comments. Mitank would suffer a ruptured eardrum and was told to stay on the ground for flying could damage his ears even further. So Lars decided to stay in Varna just a little bit longer while the rest of the party would return back to Berlin. Now here's where things take a turn for the strange. CCTV footage from the airport shows Lars behaving strangely, for lack of a better word. Dropping his luggage, running in a sprint, hopping a fence, the kind of things you would do if you were running away from somebody. His final texts warned his mother to cancel his credit cards as he believed he was being pursued. This footage was the last time he was ever seen as he vanished without a trace shortly thereafter. Both German and Bulgarian authorities launched investigations, but nobody found anything. Hospital records turned up nothing. And outside of a few disconnected sightings of alleged hitchhikers, which could have matched descriptions, nothing was ever outright confirmed. So what happened? <laughs> what happened? There are theories. Some speculate perhaps that the medication he was prescribed was causing a psychological breakdown, combined with the paranoia of being attacked and reeling from the attack earlier in the week. The doctor who prescribed that medication, though, noted he never even filed the prescription. And the doctor was perplexed and concerned with the seemingly causeless change of behavior. 
Number five, the Dark Watchers. California is oft considered one of the most beautiful states. It's got gorgeous mountains, lush beaches, sunny days. It's practically a paradise. But behind sun streaked sands at the peaks of the Santa Lucia Mountains lies a dark secret. A mysterious group of shadowy beings watching over the people below. The locals call them Los Vigilantes Oscuros. Los Vigilantes Oscuros, or the Dark Watchers, were first reported during the 18th century by Spanish settlers who arrived there. The story would describe these tall, featureless specters that would appear for a moment serving as a warning before someone's imminent disappearance. It was the last thing you'd ever see. Now these creatures towered over mortals and looked human enough, but were anything but. They stood 10 to 12 feet tall and were said to be draped in cloaks or capes and wore large brimmed hats like that of a witch. Folklore and oral stories describe these creatures as sternly observing, watching over on high and seemingly only pursuing those who disturbed them. But it is said that those who approach these figures vanish into oblivion, never seen again, not even leaving behind a footprint. So what are they? With hundreds of years worth of reports and sightings, surely someone must have some guess as to what scary shadow people are watching you in the mountains. Now the prevailing and admittedly kind of dull theory is that the dark watchers are a symptom of pareidolia, a very common psychological phenomenon in which the human brain attempts to seek out patterns that it recognizes in something weird. It's why our brain often fills in strange details in the sky. If we see something up there, we can see a flying saucer kind of because we want it to be a flying saucer, you know? Our brain fills in the details we think we see. Encounters of dark watchers could just be the shadows of swaying trees or creatures darting about in the night and tired eyes mistaking it for something else. But this video is about unsolved paranormal mysteries and it's more likely this might be a paranormal phenomenon for which there is no comfortable scientific or reasonable explanation. These creatures through the veil exist in a way I just can't understand. So perhaps it's best for now that we follow their example and you know what we just watch we just observe we take nothing but photos we leave footprints I think that's how it goes and we keep watching top five scary the shadow people told me to say that it's actually crazy the shadow people also told me that their one wish is they want for you guys out there to like like and comment and subscribe and hit that little bell to make sure you get all the videos that we put out it's weird that they were so specific with their orders but that's <laughs> I'm just relaying what they told us so keep on watching top five scary but do all that subscribing business at the end of this video because otherwise you're gonna miss the rest of the California mysteries I got for you. Number four, the ghost of Hollywood. The Hollywood sign is probably one of the most iconic landmarks on the west coast. Instantly you see that and you know you're in La La Land. But did you know it might be haunted by the spirit of a Hollywood starlet who took her life years ago? Beneath the monument to Tinseltown's glitz and glamour lies a dark secret that perhaps would be better left buried. Peg Entwistle was a young actress and a Hollywood hopeful who had a dream like many before her to come to Hollywood and become a household name making it big on the silver screen. She had a small career on Broadway and then traveled to California to make it in the pictures and landed a role in a picture 13 women. Now by the time the film had premiered to test audiences her role was cut almost entirely down to 12 women causing her to fall into a depression. The film released and was neither a commercial or critical hit. Despondent and Twistle thought there was no hope for her. On September 16th 1932 she left her home to climb the Hollywood sign and cast herself off of the H to the hiking trail below. Now since since then, hikers and visitors to Hollywood's famous landmark have reported strange occurrences around the tourist spot. Hikers claim they can smell strange perfume in the air, thought to be Peggy's favorite. Joggers sometimes claim they see an ethereal woman in 1930s with a sad expression walking down the trail. That could also just be Lana Del Rey though. One park ranger, John Arbogast, claims he sees her almost nightly whenever it's too foggy. Sees her sitting, brooding, forever trapped in the place she could never make her dreams happen. This does give me an idea though, maybe a little way to solve everybody's problems. Maybe somebody makes a movie about the ghost and the Hollywood sign and then instead of blowing your budget on special effects, you ask her to play the ghost. She gets to star in a big movie. You get to make a movie about ghosts. She might pass on. Everybody wins. Win, 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 win. Just make sure if you make that movie, I produce that, okay? So keep me in the credits. Next up at number three, the mystery of Oak Island. And whilst many of you will know this particular entry, there's no denying the fact that the eternal mystery that is Oak Island is worth mentioning 
happening every single damn time. And its inception is an event that has long evaded the unscrupulous eye of history. You know the story, right? In Nova Scotia, just off the coast of eastern Canada, lies a small island that has allegedly been the site of our civilization's greatest of treasures, although no one has ever been able to locate the exact point of where that treasure lies, causing countless individuals to fall into a wild obsession with unearthing its eternal mystery. In fact, the cause of Oak Island's mystery is down to the fact people have found treasure there, many of which have been carbon dated to several hundred years old, and the story of the Money Pit, a mysterious shaft that has been excavated countless times throughout history, which actually exists with actual structural records, has forced dozens of businesses to go bankrupt trying to solve its enigma. So here we are with our mystery, who the hell built this place? Now, there are hundreds of theories as to who would have constructed such an intricate place to conceal their treasure, the most popular being Captain William Kidd, the pirate that sailed to North America in the late 1600s, burying his plunder there so no one else could find it. Another theory states that the pit was constructed to house none other than Mary Antoinette's jewels, who after the Parisian uprising at the Palace of Versailles, gave her treasures to a lady in waiting, who then fled France and ended up in Nova Scotia, where using her royal connections, contracted the French Navy to construct the Oak Island Pit, making sure that the incredibly rare jewels of her queen would never be discovered. And strangely enough, there has actually been credible evidence for this theory recently in 2017, when a 500 year old brooch was discovered containing a huge garnet similar to that of which Mary Antoinette was reported to often wear. I mean, we could talk about all of these theories for an entire video, but as so far as unsolved events in history go, this one remains to be exactly that. Swinging in at number two, the Yonaguni Monument. Okay, where do we even begin with this one? Because if you've seen any of our ancient mystery series, then this one definitely deserves its place amongst their ilk. But the event that we're possibly alluding to in the case of the Yonaguni Monument may be a geological enigma that predates known civilization itself, involving an entire continent submerging deep beneath the ocean. Yeah, and whilst that may sound like a massive leap, let's just take a look at the strange properties of the Yonaguni Monument before we jump to any kind of conclusions. Off the coast, of Japan submerged beneath the southernmost Ryukyu Islands lie a formation of potentially man-made monoliths, which has led to decades of debate as to the true nature of this strange geological formation. The monument itself consists of very fine sandstone and mudstone, with its main feature being a rectangular formation measuring about 90 feet tall, and consisting of several other strange formations that seemingly don't make sense as to how they have been naturally formed. Now, despite this massive debate between the Yonaguni Monument being natural or man-made, perhaps the most mind-blowing theory comes from the renowned geologist Robert Schock of Boston University, who states that the Yonaguni Monument is indeed most likely a natural formation, possibly used and modified by humans in the past, before seemingly sliding away to the murky depths of the ocean during a geological event that occurred in ancient history. On the flip side, the geologist that discovered the monument, Masaki Kimura, claimed that the structure was undoubtedly artificial, created by an ancient civilization at least 10,000 years ago, accurately carved and created before sliding into the ocean following unknown tectonic activity. Kimura also goes on to say that not only that, but he can also identify a nearby pyramid, castles, entire roads, other monuments, an entire stadium at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, yeah, this one is quite something. What do you guys think? Let me know. And finally, coming in at our number one spot, the creation of Baalbek. Because, holy moly, if this one isn't one of the most mysterious unsolved events in history, I'm not entirely sure what is. Who the hell built Baalbek in Lebanon, the most mysterious ruins of the entire Roman Empire, a monumental, supposedly 2,000 year old temple to the god Jupiter that sits atop three separate thousand ton stone blocks? To put it into perspective, the monoliths at Stonehenge weigh about 1 40th of that. Yeah. You heard that correctly, thousand ton stone blocks. And despite being the diligent record keepers that they were, there is no record of who ordered this temple to be built, how these monolithic stones were cut, why they were cut, or how they even came to be, and how the temple itself came to be abandoned, because for the most part, whoever built Baalbek just up and left. Now, there are many mythological and cultural legends as to the origins of Baalbek. Some say that Cain built it to hide away from the wrath of God. Others say that giants built it at the command of Nimrod, which 
which would eventually become the Tower of Babel. In fact, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, some claim that the intergalactic landing pad alluded to in its tail was in itself Baalbek, a site constructed purely for the reception of ancient astronauts. In fact, though, the actual mystery of Baalbek resides more within its geographical location. What was the point in cutting such enormous rocks out in the middle of nowhere? Why was this temple even built where it was? And why would the Romans go to such great lengths to create a structure that wasn't efficient in location instead of next to a major city or a port? The Romans weren't exactly known for doing things without efficiency and purpose. That's what made them so successful, after all. In fact, Baalbek seems so out of character to have been built by the Romans that many scholars completely eschew any historical engineering correlation with them and simply state that the Romans never built Baalbek but discovered it and then added their iconic pillars to Jupiter and repurposed the ruins as their own kind of temple. Yeah, I'm stumped guys. The construction of Baalbek, who made it, when they did, how they did it and why they did it remains to be one of the most mysterious events in history. Kicking off at number 5, Coral Castle. And no, that is not my imitation of Rick Grimes trying to call his son a fortified structure. Sorry, that was a terrible joke. But the actual mystery of Coral Castle is equal parts true engineering enigma and equal parts perhaps the most American thing that you've ever heard of. Along the highways and byways of rural America, there are countless tourist attractions that litter the way, but one of them in particular may actually have a much more intriguing mystery than the rest. Just before 1920, a Latvian man named Edward Lee Scanlon was jilted by his young bride just a day before their wedding and so dejected and depressed Edward left his home country to head to America. Here after becoming a recluse and discovering a strange affinity for magnetism Edward spent the next 28 years constructing a bizarre megalithic castle from oolite a limestone sediment similar to coral. Now although the vast majority of this structure now is ruinous which operates as a popular tourist attraction on the roadside the actual structural properties of coral castle have baffled people for decades. Given the fact that Lee Scanlon worked completely alone, shifting over a thousand tons of oolite rock into place with no conventional machinery and no other means of hauling such a large amount of minerals and materials. As the legend goes, at one point a few local teenagers claimed to have stumbled upon Lee Scanlon working on the structure late at night, reporting that he had caused the blocks of coral to move like hydrogen balloons floating perfectly into place without the aid of any tools. Strangely enough, this led to wild rumours that Lee Scowning was using telekinesis to build the castle, a claim which he refuted. In fact, the only tool that Lee Scowling ever spoke of using was a machine that he referred to as a perpetual motion holder. Before his death, whenever he was asked how he constructed the place, he simply stated that he understood the laws of weight and leverage well. And on several occasions, he stated publicly that he had discovered the secrets of the pyramids and that once you know how to do it, it's easy. I mean, this one is a little tongue in cheek, but what do you guys think? Another eccentric close with too much time on his hands or a structural genius that had insight into a long forgotten knowledge. Let me know. Coming in at number four, Kaspar Hauser. And who the hell was Kaspar Hauser? A mystery that has completely perplexed historians for nearly two centuries, leading to an insane web of speculation, an entire network of conspiracy that extends its tendrils all the way to the royalty of Napoleon. On the 26th of May 1828, a teenage boy appeared on the streets of Nuremberg, Germany. His name was Kaspar, a boy of 16. He was filthy, could speak only a few words, and had a letter with him addressed to a captain of the Bavarian cavalry. He kept repeating the phrase, I want to be a cavalryman as my father was in old Bavarian, but the city guard dismissed his ramblings and imprisoned him as just another vagabond in Nuremberg Castle. His strange origin drew the attention of the city's mayor, who claimed that despite his stunted appearance, the boy had an excellent memory and was quick to learn. Eventually, after befriending the mayor, Kasper spoke of what he could remember of his life before and explained in great detail at living totally alone in a darkened cell two meters long, one meter wide. Each morning, Kasper said, he would wait to find rye bread and water next to his bed. Periodically, he said the water would taste bitter and after drinking it, he would sleep more heavily than usual, where he'd wake up to find his hair and his nails had been cut. Kasper claimed that the first human he had contact with was a mysterious man dressed in a dark hood, his face completely covered. He taught him to write his name and taught him the same phrase he would repeat when he was found. Eventually, 
eventually this story led the European aristocracy to believe that Caspar was an exiled prince, held captive for his entire life to prevent a line of succession. As the year passed, Caspar would live and learn in many of the Bavarian noble houses, where allegedly there were many attempts on his life by the same hooded men that he had described in the darkened cell. They got him in the end though, and on the 14th of December 1833, he was mysteriously stabbed and he died three days later. On his grave in Latin, read the words, Here lies a mysterious one who was killed in a mysterious manner. Beats me. Next up, at number three. The Golan structure. Alright, guys, if Cat Should Bib had you scratching your head, then the Golan structure is going to require some form of head scratching machinery. Let me introduce you to the Golan structure, also known as Rajum El Hiri, an ancient megalithic monument that resides in the Israeli occupied portion of Golan Heights, just off of the east coast of the Sea of Galilee. Made up of more than 42,000 basalt rocks arranged in concentric circles with a mound that is 15 foot tall at its center, the Golan structure has often been referred to as the Stonehenge of the Levant. Why? Well, of course, because it dates back to at least the early Bronze Age to between 3000 and 2700 BCE. So, what is it? Who built it? What purpose did it serve? Yeah, that'll be a we don't have a freaking clue on pretty much. All of those points. The outermost wall of this structure is 520 feet in diameter and 8 feet high. And since archaeological excavations have thus far yielded very few material remains, most Israeli archaeologists believe that this site was certainly not of a defensive position or a residential quarter, but most likely, as the vast majority of these enigmas are, it was a ritual center. And not only that, but a ritual center that is possibly linked to the cult of the dead. But on that note, there's even more of a mystery because so far, no human remains have ever been found at the site, only objects pointing to its function as some kind of tomb. And also, hold on to your hats, guys, because this is where it gets weirder. At the center of the Golan structure, the actual entrance to a tomb was discovered, one that during the June and December solstices, its axis is perfectly aligned with. Yeah. More questions, fewer answers. The thing is though, as its namesake is the Stonehenge of the Levant, no other structures of its kind have ever been discovered, which is even more of a head scratcher considering the fact that in ancient Britain as well as in South America, structures like this are pretty common. Some believe that its purpose was to worship Tammuz and Ishtar, the ancient Mesopotamian fertility gods. Others suggest that it was used by the Dakmas of the Zoroastrians to lay out their dead and let the birds remove the flesh from their bones. Some say that it was a calendar or a site to observe the constellations for religious calculations. Maybe it was all of these things at some point in time, but as it remains, we may never know. Coming in at number two, the Great Lakes Copper Mystery. Oh boy, here we go. If you're not already feeling perplexed at the mysteries of the ancient world, then I'm fairly certain that this one will knock your metaphorical socks off. In the wilds of Michigan's Isle Royal National Park, it remains a beautiful and remote location, but thousands of years ago, the island was home to a thriving mining industry. Yes, mining. The rich veins of copper that ripple through the site's bedrock certainly drew the attention of the early Native Americans, and the fact that they diligently used this ore to make tools and jewelry is evident still. But the actual extent of their operation remains a complete and utter mystery. Why? Well, because around six and a half thousand years ago, there is clear and startling evidence to suggest that roughly 500,000 tons of copper was mined from the land. 500,000 tons of copper, which simply put is a staggering amount. Now, the copper culture complex is an astounding feat of ancient civilization regardless, but here is where our mystery takes another turn. You know why? Because Michigan copper is some of the purest copper on the planet. Keep that thought in mind. And 500,000 tons of it, well, frankly put, there should be more evidence to its use throughout the Midwest. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of a leap here, and I'm going to point us toward another ancient mystery, one that occurred off the coast of Turkey, roughly around the 14th century BC. A shipwreck that was discovered just off the east shore of Uluburun, discovered by a sponge diver back in 1982. Now, the Uluburun shipwreck is a bit of a mystery in and of itself, but it's with the content of its cargo that we're concerned with here. Within the hull of the ship, 
shipwreck, over 10 tons of copper oxide ingots were discovered. Now, oxide ingots, which are named so down to the fact that they are shaped with rectangular handholds on either side, were relatively common in the late Bronze Age period of the Mediterranean Sea. You know what's weird? Testing on these ingots later discovered that they were extraordinarily pure for others of its kind. In fact, more than 99.5% pure. The oxides themselves were brittle blister copper with voids and slag bits that only occur when multiple pourings were made outdoors over wood fires. There is only one type of ore of this purity, Michigan copper, the kind mined over six and a half thousand years ago in the copper culture complex of North America. Yeah, beats me guys. And finally coming in at the one spot, the Ness of Brodgar. And I absolutely adore this particular Neolithic mystery. And at the moment, this is pretty much my direct inspiration for scholarly study of the ancient world. Now, we've covered this area quite a few times on this channel. And if you'd like to find out more about places like Scara Bray, the ancient site discovered on the Orkney Isles of Northern Scotland, then please check out our Scottish history list. And also, you know, do your own discovering because Neolithic Orkney is absolutely amazing. But there's another place that is even more remarkable than Scara Bray, the Ness of Brodgar, perhaps one of the most important discoveries in archaeological record depicting just what the hell was going on during the Neolithic period of ancient Britain. Now back in 2003, in a site that occupies the central position with the Orkney Archipelago that lies between the locks of Stenness and Haray, an imposing complex of monuments were discovered, a series of structures that seemingly were of pivotal importance to Neolithic Orcadians and perhaps even further afield, perhaps even the whole of ancient Britain. The site itself, which lies between the already discovered Ring of Brodgar, a Neolithic stone circle that has its own mysteries, as well as the equally mysterious stones of Stenness, dates back to at least 3300 BC. As of 2016, 14 structures have been discovered, with many of them being built on top of each other, suggesting perhaps an even older use of this site and a location of incredible importance to the Neolithic people of ancient Britain. Without a doubt though, the most impressive structure known as Structure 10, which appears to be a Neolithic pyramid, is even more of a head scratcher. Yeah, I just said Neolithic pyramid. Around this site, which was used prolifically up until around 2200 BCE, after which it abruptly stopped, archeologists have since discovered the bones of approximately 400 cattle, around, wi around which the carcasses of several red deer were placed, with many of their tibia bones being cracked and extracted for marrow, suggesting the site of a feast. Do you know what's weirder though? During this event, there is also evidence of the temple being largely destroyed, brick by brick. Seemingly, for some reason, the Neolithic Orcadians built this site as a place of incredible importance, used it for a thousand years, and then one day, threw a party and tore the whole thing down. I have no idea, guys, but most importantly, I want to know. Coming in at five, Hotel Monte Vista, Arizona. Hotel Monte Vista is a famous and historic hotel located one block north of US Route 66 in Flagstaff, Arizona. The hotel was built back in 1927 and is a centerpiece of the historic downtown district. However, it's become more popular for the otherworldly goings on inside its walls. Guests who have stayed in room 220 have experienced the TV changing channels on its own, and some even said they have felt cold hands touch them while they slept. However, arguably the most popular ghost story to emerge from the hotel is that of the phantom bellboy, who is said to knock on doors and announce room service, but when guests open their doors, no one's there. Another popular haunting and perhaps one of the most disturbing is the sound of an infant crying in the basement. I quote, staff have found themselves running upstairs to escape the sound of the cries. Though the sounds are very real to those who hear them, there's been no information that has explained the phenomenon phenomenon. That is a direct quote from the hotel's website. Spooky. Would you dare stay there? Coming in at 4, Ariana Grande's haunting. Now, we have a Hollywood ghost story at this number coming from the mouth of none other than Ariana Grande. Yep, that's right. Ariana Grande was supposedly haunted by a ghost back in 2013 when she visited Stull Cemetery in Kansas, a place that is supposedly so scary the Pope refuses to fly over it because it's reputed to be one of the seven gates to hell. 
Yeah. Ariana explained to Complex, I quote, I felt this sick overwhelming feeling of negativity over the whole car and we smelled sulfur which is the sign of a demon and there was a fly in the car randomly which is another sign of a demon. That sounds like a stretch to me. I was like this is scary let's leave. I rolled down the window before we left and said we apologize we didn't mean to disrupt your peace. Then I took a picture and there are three super distinct faces in the picture. They are faces of textbook demons. Now the story gets even creepier, stick with me. According to Ariana, when she tried to send the picture to her manager the next day, she was met with an error message that read, this file can't be sent, it's 666 megabytes. Weird things began to occur following the incident and Ariana was forced to delete the picture. I quote, I was going to sleep about two weeks ago, I had just gotten off the phone and as soon as I closed my eyes I heard this really loud rumble right next to my head. When I opened my eyes it stopped immediately, but when I closed my eyes it started again with whispers. Every time I closed my eyes I started seeing these really disturbing images with red shapes. Then I opened my eyes and scooched over to the left side of my bed and there was this massive black matter. I don't know what it was, it was like a cloud of something black right next to me. I started crying. I watched it move to the front of my bed and then I fell asleep. I woke up and it was gone. Now. I'll be honest, it's hard for me to believe this one without the evidence to back it up, but if Ariana says it happened, then I guess it happened. Coming up next at number three, St. John's Dance. And you may have heard mention of this one before, but perhaps not in this context. You see, it's important that we note that in modern times, St. John's Dance or St. Vitus's Dance is a terrible disease also known as Sydenham's Chorea that affects the nervous system and results in a series of hysterical jerking movements of the limbs often exhibited in young children. Generally speaking, it isn't infectious, but that doesn't figure to explain the countless records of mass hysterical dancing that occurred throughout history, of literally thousands of people across Europe being afflicted by a manic need to dance. The earliest known outbreak occurred in the 7th century and was primarily thought to occur during times of intense hardship, particularly affecting the peasant and working classes. So what? You're a peasant in Dark Age Europe and all of a sudden you just start dancing and can't stop, somehow infecting the rest of your village, town or city until there's a horde of people doing the exact same thing, potentially collapsing from exhaustion or dying from a heart attack. Well, yeah, because that's exactly what happened. One of the most well documented cases was in 1518 in the Austrian city of Strasbourg where a woman named Frau Trofia began dancing in the streets and within a month 400 people had joined her. Yeah, she danced for a month and loads of people died. Now there are many, many theories on the true explanation of St. John's dance and scholars still argue as to whether it truly was a real contagious disease or merely a social phenomenon. One of those theories suggests a particular fungi had infected their crops and another suggests that it was all a misunderstanding and St. John's dance was actually the practice of some secretive European cult. <sighs> yeah. Beats me guys. Swinging in at number two, the remains of Richard III. And this one, strangely enough, is the perfect blend of ancient mystery and potentially contemporary unexplainable intrigue. Because that's exactly what you all came for, right? Also, I mean, this one is already pretty much solved, but it's in the details where its mystery truly shines. We all know Richard III, right? A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. But well, apparently this woman, Scottish author and historian Philippa Langley, knew him a little bit better than anyone else did. Now, it's important to note that history had long forgotten the final resting place of Richard III, the last Plantagenet King of England, and after his defeat at the Battle of Bosworth, his remains were scattered to the winds of history. After all, history is written by the winners. Well, let's fast forward to modern times when in September 2012, Philippa Langley led an excavation of a car park in Leicester city centre. A few signs pointed toward it potentially being the ruined remains of Greyfriars Church, but in the words of Langley, she had a strange feeling, one that she couldn't quite place, and something was telling her that Richard III was buried beneath that very car park. Now the dig team was on a very tight budget and only had one chance at excavating a tiny portion of the car park. And guess what? The exact place that Philippa Langley had a strange feeling about turned out to be the final resting place of Richard III's remains. And not only that, but the parking space that he was buried beneath was marked with a large painted R on the tarmac used to signify a reserved parking space. I mean, all of this can be explained away, right? Eventually someone would have found the remains of the dead king, but you can't deny the fact that the strange cosmic coincidence that led Langley to his final resting place is much more mysterious than the dead. English king in a car park. 
And finally coming in at our number one spot, the Tunguska event. And I absolutely love this entry for its cosmic significance alone and the potential warning sign that we should all be very wary of. Let's head on over to remote Siberia where on the bright summer morning of the 30th of June 1908, a massive impact explosion, the likes of which has never before been seen in human history, completely flattened a remote area of the Siberian wilderness, covering over 2,000 square kilometers of isolated forest. As far as we know, no one was caught in the blast, but if they were, they would have certainly been obliterated by a shockwave 1,000 times greater than that of the Hiroshima atomic bomb. The Tunguska explosion completely flattened over 80 million trees in its blast radius, rupturing their roots like grass to a lawnmower. 50 or so miles away, those native to the region were knocked flat on their feet by the blast, windows shattered and buildings subsided. For all intents and purposes, it was the result of an unimaginable power. And if Tunguska had occurred over a metropolitan area, an entire city would have likely been flattened. So, what was it? Well, the leading scientific consensus is that the explosion of the Tunguska event was caused by the impact of a small asteroid, one that had possibly burned up in Earth's atmosphere and then produced a shockwave that resulted in the aforementioned cataclysm. However, not everyone buys that hypothesis, and many other researchers and scientists have proposed the Tunguska event being the result of a leak of natural gas from deep within the Earth's crust that became ignited by a storm and resulted in the Tunguska hellfire. Most evidence, though, points towards Tunguska being the result of an asteroid, albeit one that luckily somehow missed the vast majority of our entire populated planet. It's also important to note that researchers believe Tunguska to be the result of a small asteroid, which is a terrifying thought in itself. It poses an incredibly important question. How would our history have been shaped if the Tunguska event occurred somewhere else? What if its intended target had changed? And more importantly, are we prepared if it ever happens again? Number five, the Pyramids and the Sphinx. Famed for giving out riddles to passers-by and would-be kings and keeping even more secrets for itself, the Sphinx and the Great Pyramids of Giza aren't just one of the best tourist destinations in the world, they're a source of never-ending speculation. Were they crafted by aliens? Are there hidden secrets lying within the Sphinx that we don't know about? Almost certainly. Let's dissect them a bit. So the Sphinx, if you haven't heard of it, this is your first time hearing about it. It's one of the seven wonders of the world or something, but this might be the first time. It's a massive limestone statue with a lion's body, and let's be real, it's a nice one at that and the head of a human. Was it always a human's face? There's some speculation and discussion about that. Some researchers have proposed that originally the Sphinx was a monument to the jackal god Anubis, and that his face was refitted at some point in the image of Anamet II, a pharaoh from around that era. Now the purpose and origin remains a point of contention to Egyptologists. What was the Sphinx built for? Is it a tomb? A monument? Just something to take photos of? Some people have even speculated that the Sphinx is older than Egypt even. A tomb? A monument? Just something to do? Researchers too have speculated that perhaps the Sphinx is older than Egypt even. Erosion pattern on the Sphinx's body appear consistent with water erosion, rather than wind erosion, raising all sorts of questions about the climate and geological history. Did Egypt used to be like a lot wetter? And that's just what puzzles people on the outside. The inside of the thing is a whole other can of worms. Some propose that there are unexplored passages or secret chambers containing wondrous treasures, ancient texts, sacred artifacts. I think the Master Sword might even be in there. Some people think there's proof of extraterrestrial life. It's a very widespread conspiracy theory that aliens were involved in the Sphinx and the pyramids and are very closely tied to ancient Egyptian culture. Some limited excavations around the Sphinx have been carried out, but because of the delicate nature of the monument, further digging is a bit uh, challenging. You don't want to be the guy who ruined one of the seven wonders of the world. They're going to make fun of you forever if that happens. We could do a whole video on the mysteries behind the Sphinx, and I sincerely hope we do because we are just scratching the surface of strange stuff going on there. But if you're looking for way more strange stuff, then you already know we have that in spades. We've got just about everything freaky you can think of. We've done a video or two on it. So hit subscribe. Please hit that little bell as well so you make sure to get our videos up to date. Don't miss a single screen, but do that at the end of this video because I got four more unsolved mysteries for you coming up right now. Number four, the Voynich Manuscript. The manuscript is one of my personal favorite unsolved mysteries out there just for how sheer little we know about it. We have nothing. It's kind of a choose your own adventure for mysteries. Is it aliens? Demons? A really convoluted historical prank? If you don't know, the Voynich Manuscript is a strange document written in a handwritten text filled with bizarre illustrations. 
Russians. No one's been able to make sense of it, primarily because it's written in a language that has never been seen elsewhere in human history. It was named after Wilfred Voynich, the Polish antiquarian who purchased it in 1912, although its ownership has passed through many hands. So what was it written for, and by who? These are the questions we've been asking, and we're probably going to keep asking over and over. The manuscript is about 240 pages, containing illustrations of plants, astronomical diagrams, humanoid figures, and other strange objects. Despite countless attempts by cryptographers, no one's been able to crack the code just yet. Some speculation has been made that it could be a biology textbook in an encoded language. Some people think it could be the scrawlings of a brilliant alchemist, magic and spell casting we couldn't possibly hope to understand. Some say it's from a forgotten civilization, while others have said maybe it's all just a load of nonsense and is just made by someone who had too much time on their hands and a vengeance against historians who wanted to prank them for centuries. The book is thought to have come from anywhere between the 15th century and the 17th century. We don't even know when this thing was written. Like I said, we know next to nothing about it. Now, if you're feeling clever and inspired, you can find a PDF of the Voynich manuscript as a free download pretty easily. Who knows? You might be the one to finally crack this case. But hey, don't be frustrated if you end up falling down a conspiracy rabbit hole many before you have tried. I looked through a few of these pages and it took me 30 seconds before I was looking like Charlie from Always Sunny at the conspiracy wall, all that red tape and stuff. Coming in at three, please stop moving the kitchen table. Uploaded to my uni days by a user named Barbara, this story tells the haunting tale of ghosts that just won't stop messing with the kitchen table. I quote, my house was fraught with weird stuff happening when we first moved in. The kitchen table would move overnight 12 to 18 inches. My keys will disappear and show up in the weirdest places like my quilt trunk. I don't know who has a quilt trunk these days, but this person does. My son Christopher went into the basement and things came flying off the shelf at him. He also saw someone walking on our wraparound porch once, but no one was there. The most obvious one was a few years ago. Twice this happened. I was sweeping the kitchen floor. The door to the porch started shaking uncontrollably. It was like someone was trying to open the door without turning the knob. It lasted about 15 seconds. Keep in mind this is a wraparound porch completely enclosed. I knew it was bad because my dogs, who will bark at a butterfly fly past the window, all looked up at the door and stepped back. Both times it happened, I was doing the same thing about the same time at night. By the way, as a side note, I walked into the kitchen table one night while going to the bathroom. It was not the first time I walked into the kitchen table because it was moved. So I just said, please stop moving the kitchen table, and it never moved again. Spooky stuff. Do you believe Barbara's story? And if so, who do you think the ghost was? A former resident of the home perhaps, or just someone who was obsessed with moving kitchen tables? Perhaps a former interior designer? You never know. You don't know the story. Coming in at number two, Demon in the Dark. Another creepy ghost story uploaded to my uni days. This one comes from a guy named Dave, who explains his very real encounter with a scary demon. My family traveled to the south of France to stay in a cottage owned by someone my dad worked with. The owners visited occasionally, but that summer it was free and we had 10 days booked in there. After a long two days on the road, we drove down a steep driveway towards a secluded mill cottage, with the water wheel sat static alongside the stone house. There was a deep cellar with stone stairs down under the wheel next to the house, and a a small river circled the place. We went into the house and chose rooms, but being set down in small copes, the house was a draft and cold from lack of use. And we settled in and turned all of the heating on, yet the house remained cold and felt damp. The first night we had set a fire in the living room and listened to a couple of my audiobooks before my sister and I went to sleep. My parents stayed up a little longer than went to bed. Around midnight they both woke up at exactly the same time, and the door to their bedroom was opening, slowly. At first they thought it was my sister, until they saw a large dark silhouette of a man framed in the doorway, standing stock still, just looking in their direction as if appraising them. After a short period, the shape turned and started to move, as if satisfied, and disappeared completely. They looked at each other but didn't speak, and both went back to sleep. The next morning, the house felt warm and dry, and sunlight was back through the windows as if something had lifted and accepted them. They spoke the next day and both agreed that although they were skeptics, it could not have been anything other than something supernatural in that doorway, deciding their worth. What do you guys think about that one? Demon encounter? Intruder? Or just trick of the light? Do you think there was a man there or is this all pretend? You tell me. I think it was just an old house that took a little while to heat up. 
but that's not very scary, is it? And finally, coming in at number one, Hotel Cecil. Uh, of course, there is no building more haunted than the Cecil Hotel that has numerous unexplained deaths and hauntings that are still ongoing today, even after it changed its name to Stay on Main. Creepier still, there's an entire list of suicides reported on its Wikipedia page, with the first reported case happening in 1931, followed by a long string of similar deaths in 1932, 1934, 1937, 1938, 1939, and 1940. The 30s were not a good time for the Cecil, that's for sure. During the same time, other tenants of the building also died by suicide, and one man was pinned to the exterior wall by truck. In 1962, a woman jumped from the ninth floor window and landed on a pedestrian, killing them both. In 1964, tenant Goldie Osgood was brutally murdered, which had remained unsolved. And of course, one of the most famous cases is that of Elisa Lam, a 21 year old traveler who was found dead in the rooftop water tank of the hotel after guests began to complain of a funky taste. Now, with this number, it isn't so much the ghosts themselves that are the unsolved haunting, but the hotel itself, which seems to curse anyone who stays in it or near it. Kicking off at number five, the tomb of Antony and Cleopatra. Now, the legendary Roman politician and general Marcus Antonius, alongside his kindred spirit Cleopatra, may well be the most notorious lovers in the history of our civilization. And although mountains upon mountains of literature have been written about their star crossed fate, the real mystery of Antony and Cleopatra came after they had both slipped from this mortal coin. Now, if you know anything about the Roman conquest of Egypt, you'll know that around 30 BC, Mark Antony and Cleopatra were not in the Romans' best books, and a general known as Octavian had waged a long and bloody campaign to bring Cleopatra's reign to an end, which he ultimately won. But sadly for us, that's where the trail runs cold, with no leads as to the two lovers' final resting place. One of the greatest unsolved mysteries in antiquity is the exact location of the final burial place of Antony and Cleopatra, but according to several ancient historians, Tonius and Plutarch to name a few, it was recorded that Octavian had permitted the two to be buried together as their surviving children were taken back to Rome to be raised as Roman citizens. There are several leads that their tomb was located somewhere west of Alexandria, but numerous excavations throughout history have proven fruitless. However, they did come close, and between 2008 and 2009, reports of the prestigious Egyptologist Zahi Hawass having found evidence of their fated tomb came to light. Although no concrete evidence has been unearthed, relics and memorial coins of the lovers have been found in small ceremonial tombs, perhaps pointing toward Cleopatra's and Antony's tomb being somewhere in the vicinity. The excavation continues, but whoever stumbles upon the tomb of Antony and Cleopatra will unearth one of history's greatest mysteries. Next up at number four, the sack of Baltimore. And now I love this particular entry, partly for its many layers and potential implications, but mainly for the fact that it's a swashbuckling tale of chaos and carnage that seemingly came out of nowhere. On June 20th, 1631, a small village named Baltimore in West Cork of Ireland was randomly and viciously attacked by pirates. Not just any pirates though, but pirates from the Barbary coast of North Africa, which at the time was synonymous with the Ottoman Empire. Now, if you couldn't tell, that's quite a distance. This incident would go down as the largest attack by Barbary pirates in both Ireland and Great Britain, and seemingly the target was a tiny village tucked in the corner of the Emerald Isle. So it posed the glaring question, why? Was it just a random chance of opportunity after the pirates had drifted off course? Perhaps, but it's not likely. See, the attack was led by a Dutch captain by the name of Jan Jansvoon van Harlem, who had changed his name to Murad Rees the Younger, which, if you can't tell, is a bit of a curveball. But that curveball may have actually been thrown by someone else entirely. You see, despite being a small village, Baltimore was actually in the middle of a power play. At the time, it was under the control of a Gaelic chieftain, Sir Finian O'Driscoll, but the nearby English colony of Cork, led by a man named Sir Walter Coppinger, also had Baltimore in his sights. History is unclear as to who pulled which string, but all signs point toward the bizarre pirate attack being orchestrated by someone else entirely, in the hopes of seizing power away from O'Driscoll. In fact, several texts have even suggested that O'Driscoll's own relatives may have orchestrated the move, as they'd been exiled to Spain following defeat at the Battle of Kinsale. Whoever did it overestimated the bloodthirst of the Barbary pirates, though, because following 
following the raid, Baltimore was virtually deserted for several generations. The best laid plans of mice and men, yeah, you know what they say. Number three, the Yonaguni Monument. You've heard of the lost city of Atlantis. Surely, of course you have. It's one of the best Disney movies you forgot about. That's a story for a whole other video. Well, what if it wasn't the only lost underwater city out there? Have you ever heard of the Yonaguni Monument? The Yonaguni Monument has sometimes been called Japan's Atlantis, and it refers to a strange, eerie underwater rock formation just off the coast of Yonaguni Island in Japan that has had people scratching their heads for years. It's a massive structure consisting of several flat rock slabs arranged in a way that seems like an intelligent life put it together. Now, some people say that this structure could be completely natural, resulting from years of erosion and tectonic activity. Certainly, stranger things have happened, and it wouldn't be completely impossible for something to form this way. But the way it exists now, the way it sits, it seems deliberately carved out, and it seems like it was an important structure to someone. Perhaps a monument, a temple, some sign of a lost city, hence the Atlantis comparisons. Is it possible this was evidence of a lost civilization buried beneath the ocean waves, forever forgotten to history? The monument being completely submerged has been fuel for the fire of speculation. Was it always underwater? Did it end up there over time? Did the water raise around it? Did the land used to look significantly different? It makes it pretty difficult to study as well, making it just that little bit more elusive, as if it wasn't mysterious enough as is. But let's be real, it was probably aliens. It was almost certainly aliens. Number two, the Bermuda Triangle. Ah, the Bermuda Triangle. Now there's an exquisite ancient mystery. One of the certified classics. Something that's eluded us for years and will probably continue to do so. It's been referred to before as the Devil's Triangle, and it's host to all manner of mysterious incidents and unexplained phenomena. One of the more infamous incidents linked to the Bermuda Triangle is the disappearance of Flight 19 in December 1945. Five Navy bombers vanished during a routine training mission alongside 14 crew members. Gone. Zilch. There was an extensive search effort, but nothing was ever found. Not so much as a bolt off the hull, a boot fished up, a hat, nothing. It was as if they were swallowed up by the void. Naturally, people went a bit wild with theories on this one. Anything from aliens, electromagnetic anomalies, alternate realities, no clipping into the back room. You know, pretty serious academic stuff. But it's bizarre. Another particularly good Bermuda baffler for you is the case of the USS Cyclops. In March 1918, the 542 foot long cargo ship carrying over 300 crew members vanished during its voyage from Barbados. No wreckage, no survivors ever found. Certainly you would think a ship that big with that many people would leave behind a little bit of evidence, right? What happened? Were they swallowed up by the very seas themselves, pulled to Davy Jones's locker by the Kraken? Or are they somewhere we can't reach them, in a place between worlds and time? The region is known for all sorts of weird stuff too, involving electronic malfunctions and compass deviations. It makes it seem like there is just something bad in the air out there. Maybe just bad vibes? Certainly seems that way. And number one, the Dorset Mass Grave. Oh, this one is a doozy, and it is one of the scariest and most confusing archeological discoveries ever found. Let me ask you, what's more fun than a barrel of monkeys? A barrel of Vikings? Well, how about a mass grave full of headless Viking bodies? No? Well, you and I find different things fun, I suppose. Way back in the yesteryear of 2008, a group of archaeologists were on a fairly routine digging operation in Dorset, a quaint little seaside town in England. They were supervising a digging operation to improve local roads and were on set to see if there was anything of note to find, you know, if they came across an old coin or an old arrowhead or something you could stuff in a museum case. For the first few days of the job, there wasn't anything particularly noteworthy discovered until they came across the mass pile of 54 entangled Viking corpses all missing their heads. I guess they thought that was probably kind of interesting. If it was just a, you know, a bunch of headless Viking bodies, that'd be one thing. But the mass grave was wrapped in confusing details. Their skulls were missing, but as well their rib cages, arms, and leg bones were all scattered around, this is disgusting, surrounded by discarded teeth. No clothes or weaponry was recovered. So what in the Allfather's name happened here? Because absolutely nothing I can imagine is pleasant. Sounds like Vikings opened up a portal to hell, went really wild with it. The teeth found around the grave had all been filed 
settled down neatly, which is very interesting. Now, it goes without saying that Viking dental surgery could not have been painless, meaning the process had to be excruciating, suggesting it was either done by a very careful tormentor or done to themselves to intimidate their opponents to show just how gritty they are. I actually don't know which of those two are preferable. They actually both sound pretty horrible. Now, as good as my theory about a bunch of Vikings opening up a portal to hell and being offered as a sacrifice is, archaeologists had some different ideas. They theorized that by looking at the wound patterns on the ribs and torso, they were surgical precise blows, which wasn't really the kind of thing you'd expect from a rabid Viking warrior flailing around a sword in a brawl. The archaeologists thought that these men were either offered up as part of a horrifyingly sadistic ritual, or it was a big time mass sentencing where everybody was sentenced to the death. Explains too where all the weapons and gear had gone. These men had been brought here from somewhere else and then left here for a long, long, long time. We might never know the truth behind the Dorset mass grave, and I'm gonna be honest, that might be fine with me. Some secrets are better left buried. Anyone else feel though that all those Viking skeletons, that might be like the world's most terrifying puzzle to put all that together? Morbid thought, not something to end the video on. Kicking off at number five, Stone Tongue. Which again is a pretty damn awesome name for a death metal band, right? But if you're a fan of this series, you'll already know that lists like these are literal golden skull mines for naming yourselves in all your death metal glory. So, metalheads that are looking for a band name, take note, please. And also, thank me later. Anyway, Stone Tongue. Let's first cast our gaze back to 1991 in Northamptonshire, Britain, where archaeologists discovered a gruesome and even stranger mutilation that emerged from the remains of Roman Britain. Now, it's no hidden secret that Britain is littered with instances of intrigue from the Roman occupation of Britain, but this one in particular seemingly doesn't fit any sort of logic or any of the many other mysteries of ancient Britain. At the bottom of a burial pit, buried beneath dozens of other bodies, archaeologists found the skeleton of a man whose tongue had apparently been amputated and instead replaced with a flat stone wedged into his mouth. The burial site at Stanwick near the River Neen dates back from between the 3rd or 4th centuries, where people in Roman Britain would have congregated in small farming communities. Now, it's certainly not rare to find makeshift burial pits in Roman Britain, in fact they are a dime a dozen, but the strange thing was, this guy was buried at the bottom, face down. And not only was he buried face down, which would usually indicate some sort of fear of him by the community, but his tongue was cut out and replaced with a stone. As researchers noted, this was something that just hasn't ever been identified as a practice so far in archaeological records. There are no other known occurrences of this ever happening in Roman Britain, so far anyway. And the fact that this was on top of the matter of him being buried face down, well, who the hell was he? What was he doing? It is believed that the man would have been in his 30s at the time of his death, and one theory is that he had mental health issues and was actually responsible for severing his own tongue. Perhaps the tongue was the community symbolically making him whole again, but then why was he buried face down? Now, archaeologists are currently trying to correlate this practice to ancient Germanic laws, but its place in a small farming community in Roman Britain, yeah, that remains a complete and utter mystery. Swinging in at number four, Cat Shabib. And I absolutely love this one, as well as pretty much all of the next few entries, because nothing gets my mind worrying quite like an ancient structure that no one knows what the hell it is, or what it was doing, or why it was even there. Let me introduce you to the Kat Shabib, an ancient wall in southern Jordan that since its identification by British diplomat Sir Alec Kirkbride back in 1948 has had archaeologists scratching their heads ever since. I say identification because Kirkbride certainly didn't discover this structure per se, but instead he noticed that whilst he was flying over Jordan there was a very apparent and very clear line across the geographical landscape. A wall, in fact, that ran 150 kilometers, making it the longest linear archaeological site in Jordan. Now, why would anyone build a wall of such length? Now, the Romans had reason to with the Picts, ancient China had reason to with Genghis Khan, but Kat Shabib? What's that all about? The thing is though, whilst the purpose of this wall is the frantic subject of debate, we do know who built it. The semi-nomadic Bedouin people led by the Arab prince Amir Shabib. Historically, there is a certain recognition of the Bedouin people using the wall, but there is still no concrete evidence to determine its purpose. Archaeologists during the 1940s and 1950s argued that the Kat Shabib was used for military and defence purposes. However, there is a clear problem with that assumption. This wall is far too low for it to have ever been a successful defensive mechanism. And although it is massive in length, at best estimates, it stood at around just a metre and a half high. What was it keeping out? 
Not a lot. So then, why have archaeologists also discovered over 100 ruined towers across its span? Yeah, more and more questions. Oh, and also, did I mention that best estimates point toward it being built in the Iron Age? Yeah. Catch your bib, everybody. A complete and utter mystery. Number three, the Queen Mary. Now, this next one is a beloved tourist spot. It's one of the most famous ships in the country, and there are few ships in the United States even half as haunted as the Queen Mary, a decommissioned ship that was converted into a hotel in Long Beach, California. It's stately, it's lush, it's got all the comfort and modern amenities of being a Navy man, bursting with restless spirits. The ship was christened in the mid 30s by the Queen Mary herself. That's why, that's why they named her that. And it was retired three decades later. It's since been converted into a hotel where guests can go and rent out a stateroom and pretend they're crossing the Atlantic in style. Now, there are a variety of spots inside the Queen Mary that are said to be congregation points for all things supernatural and strange. Perhaps if you know already anything about the Queen Mary, the most famous is Stateroom B340. Now, this was a problem before the place was even haunted. In 1948, a passenger, Walter J. Adamson, passed away in the room under unknown conditions. Nothing really came of this event until 1960. When a woman who was staying in B340 reported that she was woken up when the bed covers were pulled away and she saw a spectral man standing at the foot of her bed, and it was no room service. She screamed and rang for a steward, but as soon as the steward arrived to assess the situation, the man had vanished. Now, guests staying in this room claim they hear someone knock at the door in the middle of the night. The Mary's maids, too, complain that they find water running in B340 when no one's been in it in days. People have reported all kinds of ghosts around the pool as well. There's a woman in an old wedding gown. People say they see a young boy in a suit, a cloud of steam appearing out of nowhere, and then a girl in a blue and white dress who disappears in an instant. Or maybe it's a gold and black dress. I'm not sure. Whatever the case, there's so many ghosts up in the Queen Mary. It's definitely worth checking out if you've got an EMF reader in your suitcase when you're going to California. Number two, Griffith Park. Now, if you're a real avid cinephile, a student of the silver screen, perhaps you'd recognize Griffith Park for its use in a ton of Hollywood productions. The sprawling, rugged, mountainous set is home to a lot more than memorabilia for Hollywood. It's also said to be home to spirits and haunted by a century-old curse. It's said to have started all the way back in 1863, when Dona Petronilla, the niece of land baron Don Antonio Feliz, was cut out of her will. She was spurned and placed a hex on his land and cursed him for this indignation. She vowed that the land would never turn a profit for him and that as long as he lived there, he would suffer misfortune until his untimely death and anyone who was stupid enough to own the land afterward would get the same treatment. Now, local historians say the man who negotiated the ranch's rights was slain in a saloon duel and the land's new owner was fatally struck by bandits in Mexico. So, not looking good. A wealthy industrialist would end up buying a 4,000 acres of the land in the 1880s. But he ended up donating the land to the city of LA after strife and all sorts of malfeasances were causing problems with his ownership. He ended up striking his wife in a rampage. Now, she survived, but he went to prison for two years and passed away almost immediately after his release. Pretty suspicious, pretty strange. The landowners all died in rags, their reputation tarnished, and now that it's LA property, Griffith Park wasn't making anyone particularly rich. Was Donna Petronilla's curse that effective or just a series of sheer coincidences? There are some who say Dona still watches over the land, ensuring her vengeance is carried out forever. Some visitors to Griffith Park claim that they see her spirit haunting the ground. Her vengeful ghost is said to appear as a lady in an all-white dress who materializes before locals for a moment. And number one, Mount Shasta. Standing nearly 15,000 feet in the air, Mount Shasta is a beautiful peak. And if you believe the legends, it could be home to some of the strangest thing in the entire country. Really just about every conspiracy theory out there has been leveled to this mountain at one point. We got UFO sightings, strange disappearances, paranormal hauntings, a lost city, lizard people. If there is a conspiracy about something strange happening in California, the odds are good it'll eventually reach Mount Shasta. It's even true of GTA 5. You look up Mount Iliad, there's so many weird mysteries going on there. Virtual real, it's everywhere. The history of mystery at, Sh oh the history of mystery, that rolls off the tongue beauty. The history of mystery, I'm gonna say that like 12 times, sorry editor. The history of mystery at Shasta goes back pretty far to the indigenous roots of the area. For the indigenous groups there, the mountain is a sacred place, sharing the territories of the Shasta, Wintu, Achimawai, Atsugewi, 
and Modoc, who all date their lineage back to when the mountain still erupted. Oh, it was a volcano. I kind of slid that under the door, but this thing used to like shoot lava. To the Modoc people, the mountain is home to the Gamakma, the creator in their stories, and where the original bones of the Modoc people were first placed. Some observers still bring offerings to the mountain and to the old gods who are thought to reside over there. Tales of mythical creatures like Sasquatch are fairly common around the area and have been for years too, but like I said, that is just the tip of all the weirdness that's going on out here. One of the more interesting mysteries, and definitely the one I find most interesting, come out of Shasta, is that of a lost city. There are some who speak of Lemuria, a theorized continent believed to have sunk over the Indian or Pacific Ocean. Theorists claim that some people survived this catastrophe, and now the Lemurians live below Mount Shasta, presumably waiting until they can come and take over the Earth, or maybe they're just chilling with advanced technology. Who's to say? This is where the lizard people come in, because these there are people who believe that the Lemurians are actually the fabled lizard people. They live under Mount Shasta, and this is where they come to have meetings about what rap stars they're going to endorse to control the Illuminati. Of course, there's also the claims of UFO sightings. One particular flying saucer seen in February 2020 made rounds when a cloud in the sky looked exactly like a flying saucer. Copy in Jordan Peele's nope. Officials denied it as just a lenticular cloud, but hey, take a look and decide for yourself because it's definitely odd. So Mount Shasta, nothing but a good trail to hike up, or is it a home to a series of mysteries bubbling and bursting just waiting to erupt? Thank you